he comes to you in such a way, look what I've done for you. Look at all I've given you. I've given myself. I've given my blood. I've given my life. I became a man for you. I love you. Why do you refuse to receive my comfort? Peace be unto you. Why do you refuse to see, receive my peace? All is well with you. Nothing's wrong with you. Everything's fine. Why? It's me. It's me. Our Savior died. He rose again for our justification. And even this morning, I do pray that God would even open your understanding. That's what he did. He opened the understanding. And you know how he did it? He, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all things in the scriptures what concerning himself. So this morning, if you are in such a place, I do pray that God would open your understanding so that you might be comforted. You might be comforted. That the Holy Spirit would feed you with joy and peace and salvation. That you might bow down even now and worship him as his disciples did. And they did. Their hearts were broken and they worshipped him. They bowed down to him. And it is at this moment of their weakness. Now, that's the situation. That's how, this is where our text finds us. In the moment of their weakness, in the moment of their upbraidment, in the moment that they were the most, they were the lowest that they could be. It is then the Lord gives the great commission. It is then he gives them this great commission. In their greatest and lowest time of sorrow. He gives the greatest of commissions. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, notice that Jesus didn't wait till they got better. Now, when everything's well, go you into all the world and preach the gospel. When you get a little more knowledge and a little more understanding, go you into all... It's not what he said. It is an immediate command. Go you now into all the world and preach the gospel in your weakest state. Why? Because that's the best preaching. When we are at our weakest state, that is the best preaching. We are then the most capable to preach. The most ready to be used in our lowest estate. How many of us hear this great commission and are waiting for some obscure level of knowledge? I will preach the gospel when, and then just fill in the blank. When I have more understanding, when. I, you know, John disagrees with that. You know what? John tells you this. He said, you have an unction of the Holy One. Listen, you know all things. Now, you either believe that or you don't. John says, you know all things. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You know all things. If you know Christ, you know all things. You know all things necessary. You know all things necessary. You know the difference between the truth and the lie. Now, you may not be able to explain it in its greatest points. You may not have the most eloquent words to describe it, but you know it. And you know it when you hear it. You know it when you hear it. Let us pray then God will open our eyes then and give us opportunities to witness of Christ. But as we, we pray, we pray that God would open our mouths so that we might speak in love toward others. Now there, as, as believers in Christ, as you who are called by the grace of God to preach this gospel, there are three things about this great commission mentioned in our text. Three things. That three questions I, that we should be that we should ask. First is, what is our gospel? If you're going to go preach a gospel, you should know what it is. Second of all, to whom are we to preach this gospel? And third, what then is the result of this gospel? So first of all, what is our gospel that we are sent to preach? Go you into all the world and preach 
the gospel. That definite article, the, tells us plainly that there is only one gospel. There are not multiple gospels. There are not many gospels. Today, as you came to worship this morning, you passed by several churches, several places of worship with different denominations on their door, Catholics, Baptists, Pentecostals, Presbyterians, Independent, Christian churches, whatever they got. Now, if you would ask them, are you preaching the gospel? Well, that would be to them a silly question. They would say, yes. Yes, we are. We're preaching the gospel, and I don't doubt that they're sincere. I don't doubt any one of them, their sincerity. But listen, whatever the gospel is, whatever the gospel is, it must be completely and absolutely founded upon the word of God. The word of God for the gospel is its source of faith and practice. The, the word of God is the basis of our gospel. Any gospel that is based on the traditions of man, the creeds of the church, or the conventions of denominations is not the gospel. If that is their standing, if that is their basis... You see, I hear men preaching, and even men who preach the sovereign grace of God, what do they turn to? They turn to the confessions. I don't care what the confessions say. The confessions are not the Word of God. They are men preaching the Word of God as I'm doing. But they're not infallible. What is infallible is the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord. And so then, we don't turn to any of those. Although they might have truth, although they might be speaking the truth, that is not the foundation of our gospel. Our gospel is founded on this. Thus saith the Lord. That's it. Any gospel that is not founded on that is not the gospel. I desire to make it very clear to you that there is only one true gospel, but there is another gospel being preached. This is the false gospel. The false gospel. The one true gospel and the false gospel today are being preached. One is the gospel of God. The other is the doctrine of devils. John says this. Try the spirits. I'll tell you this. I love you and you love me but you better, you better do this every time I preach. You better try the spirits to see whether they be of God or not. I'm talking about preachers. I'm talking about their message. You should test the message that I preach to you against the Word of God to make sure it's so. You would be wise to do that every time. And listen, the only gospel being preached in religion today is the false gospel of free will works religion. But the only true gospel is the gospel of God's salvation by free and sovereign grace. These two are in direct opposition to each other. Now someone who's preaching free will works religion say, I preach salvation by grace. They will. I'll tell you that. And be, think they're being honest. But yet if you listen, they will say a man must needs add some work or volition of will in order to make salvation effectual. You tell me, that is not of grace. That's of works. That's a message of works. Paul said that in Romans 11. He said you cannot mix the two. You cannot mix works and grace. It is impossible to mix works and grace. He said if it is of grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if it be of works and not of grace, then works is no more works. You cannot mix works and grace. Either salvation is the full free grace of God or it is the work of man. And you know those men crept in the church of Galatia and they were preaching Jesus Christ plus circumcision. That's what they were preaching. Jesus Christ, yes. You must be saved by the grace of God. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you must also obey the law of circumcision. This is what Paul said. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ 
to another gospel. You see, grace and another gospel are in direct opposition to each other. And if you're removed from the gospel, you are removed from Christ. You're removed from Christ. He said, which is not another? But there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. See, they don't eradicate the gospel of Christ. They pervert it. They pervert it. They don't throw away the book. They just pervert it. But though we or an angel from heaven preach to you another gospel than that which we have preached to you, let them go to hell. That is the exact translation of that. Let them be a cur- Let them go to hell. The gospel Paul preached was not of works but of free and sovereign grace. And there are five things concerning this gospel that every one of us who are believers know and understand and believe. Every time this gospel is preached, these things are mentioned. Every time. First of all, the total absolute depravity of man. This is the foundation by which we meet sinners. This is how we approach sinners. We approach them as they are. I know the, the church, the false church, would, would butter men up. They would try to tell you how good you are, how, how much God needs you, how much that you can, you can help God. No, I can tell you by this, you cannot help God and you cannot help yourself. You are absolutely, utterly, and completely depraved. We must meet men on this condition. One man said, if you're wrong on the fall, you're wrong on it all. If you miss out on this, that by our father, Adam, all the human race was condemned to death and sin, you've missed it. The truth of the gospel is that Adam was our federal head. That's the truth. God made him upright, perfect, and God set him in the perfect environment. Isn't that a false idea that, well, if I just have the perfect environment, I'll be better. No, Adam had the perfect environment. He even had the perfect nature. And yet, he still failed. And God gave him only one commandment, not to eat of that tree. And he, in rebellion, ate of that tree. And what happened to him? He died. He died spiritually. And the proof of that was he, he tried to cover his nakedness. He took the works of his hands, the fig leaves, and he sewed them together to make aprons for themselves to cover their sin. Isn't this what man does by nature? All men by nature, they are exposed of God. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. And what does he do? He runs to his leaves, and he runs to his works, and he sews them together and says, Ah, see, I'm covered. Oh, but that's not enough. When God speaks, when God acts, that's when the preacher speaks, but when God speaks, what does man do? He runs when he cannot find a hide in his leaves. What does he do? He runs to the forest, tries to find more leaves, more works to cover his nakedness, to hide him from God. Isn't that what men do right now? They're running from God. Why do men not want to come here? Why? Running from me? I tell you, they're running from God. Why? They are depraved. You see, God is the only hope for man, and yet man in depravity runs from God. He runs to hell like it's heaven, and runs from heaven as though it were hell. Man is absolutely and utterly depraved and wicked. Scripture says that the natural mind, the carnal mind, is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me. Do you see the total depravity? Man is not willing, and man cannot be willing. (laughs) That is absolutely the worst case. For man to not only not want to is one thing, but not to be able to. Man is script by scripture is dead in trespasses and sins. Now listen, if you've never known this about yourself, if you have no clue what I'm talking about, it's because you're not saved. You're still in rebellion. 
One thing every believer knows is his absolute depravity. His absolute inability to uh, please God in the flesh. That's just a basic principle of the gospel. You see, if God has never opened your eyes to see your inability and utter ruin of your nature, then you will never need Christ and never come to Christ. If God doesn't show you your need, you'll never come. The second thing about the gospel is the unconditional election of God. I heard from someone recently that uh, she'd been to Baptist churches most of her life and never heard a message on election. That is, uh, it's not astounding, but to me I understand they're not preaching because they don't believe it. But I told her, I said, you've never heard of election because you've never heard the gospel. You've never heard the gospel. The gospel of man is rooted in man. The gospel of man is rooted in himself, in his will, in his works. But the gospel of God is rooted in God. In God. Election, friends, is not difficult to understand. People say, oh, I just don't understand election. Yeah, you do. You just don't believe it. People just don't believe it. They don't want to. Election is not hard. Listen, God chose a people. Does anybody understand that, miss that so far? God chose a people. In sovereign free love, without any merit of their own, God, for His own glory and His own purpose, chose a people. Anybody miss that? It's not hard to understand. God purposed to save those people. God said they're going to be holy and without blame before me. When did He do this? He did this in eternity. He did this when there was no, not yet anything created before the world began. God chose a people. It's not hard to understand. As a matter of fact, this is not a point of debate. People say, well, that's just your opinion. No, it's the Word of God. Have you ever tried to read the Word of God and delete the word election or predestination? Matter of fact, uh, Brother Don Fordner, he was in a college, they did that. They they would not permit them to say election or predestination. So my brother took the word of God and began to read and bleep out the word elect or election. Bleep according to the foreknowledge of God. <laughs> he, he went through all those scriptures with the word election and predestination and he, he bleeped them out. You would have to bleep out the book. It's throughout the book. Listen to this plainly. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us. The us are who we who believe in Christ with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as He had chosen us. When was all this taking place? Before the foundation of the world. And what did He chose us for? That we should be holy and without blame before Him. In love having predestinated us unto adoption by ch of children. And listen how? By Jesus Christ. Not only purpose that we should be holy, He purposed how we should be holy. By Jesus Christ. What for the reason? What is the reason? To the praise of the glory of His grace. You see why God did it? You see how God does it? You see when God did it? It's not debatable. It's not my opinion. If you don't believe it, you just don't believe God's Word. You should be honest. Men should be honest about this. They just don't believe the gospel. No matter how they rage about this truth, no matter how much they hate God's word about election, seeing the depravity of man, we know this, that if there were no election, there would be no salvation. You know who know that? Believers. We understand that. We know this to be true. We know that there's none righteous, there's not none that seeketh after God, there's none that understandeth. We know this, that in the flesh no man can please God. Therefore we glory in the election of God. We praise God for His sovereign election. Number three, that we preach the particular redemption of Christ. This means that God's chosen people, He chose them to be holy without blame, but the means He chose is not by any merit of their own, but by the sovereign Savior, Jesus Christ. 
by Jesus Christ. This is how he purposed that we, the elect, should be saved. By Jesus Christ. Salvation is not by Jesus and you, not by Jesus and the Pope, not by Jesus and some man or works or decision of men. It is by Jesus Christ alone. That is how salvation is accomplished. Since all of the elect were born sinners, we could by no means merit the righteousness of God, nor could we offer an offering for our sin. This is what Jesus did. He did both of those. He performed a righteousness for us by his own obedience as a man. You see, Adam was our federal head, but now Christ, even before Adam, was our federal head. God put us in Christ, and by doing so, he put us in union with Christ so that he should bear the weight and responsibility of all our salvation. You see that? You see, the weight of salvation does not in one ounce rest upon you. Isn't this glorious? Isn't this a wonderful message? It is if you know your depravity. You see, if you're wrong on depravity, you have something to offer. You miss out on this. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 22, it says, Even the righteousness of God which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. You see how the righteousness of God is earned? It is earned by Jesus Christ. He is the center. He is the sum of our salvation. And not only this was he our righteousness, but he was also our offering. The Apostle Paul concerning the preaching of the gospel says this, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now we as ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be you reconciled to God. See, Paul's preaching the gospel. Reconciliation. How then are sinners reconciled to God? Here it is. For he hath made him to be sin for us. That's how we're reconciled. God, can, God is not going to impute our sins to us because he imputed them to Christ. He made Christ to be sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, which God ordained that we should be. You see, Christ was only fulfilling the will of God. And by fulfilling the will of God, he actually redeemed us. He actually saved all the elect. The result of his obedience and death is not that he died for all men without exception, but died for those that the Father gave him. You see, Jesus didn't make salvation possible. That again is a false gospel. But we preach salvation accomplished. Salvation finished. Work is done. The work is done. And this is not a matter of our opinion. And again, this is not a matter of debate. Because that's what people will say to you when you preach this gospel. That's your opinion. No. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verse 12. In this matter of redemption, in this matter of redemption, redemption is not something that takes place when a person accepts Jesus. No. Redemption was accomplished. Redemption was accomplished. Look at this in verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into the holy, once into the holy place. Listen. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. How long is this redemption? Eternal redemption. The redemption that he purposed to give us is the redemption he accomplished and it is the redemption he applies. That redemption he obtained. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. 
but this man. After he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. What does that mean? He's forever finished. The work is forever done. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by his one offering he hath perfected forever. Who? Them that are sanctified. Those who God set apart. That's exactly who he perfected. He perfected. Therefore Jesus before his death gives us this victory speech. In John chapter 6 he says this. This is the Father's will. That of all which he hath given me. I should lose nothing. But raise it up again at the last day. Is that not a victory speech? That's just a victory speech. I know this is the Father's will. And this is exactly how it's going to happen. I'm going to redeem the elect. And the elect will be redeemed. And I'll lose not one of them. Not one of them. And the fourth thing we preach is this. We preach the effectual call of the Spirit. This is the gospel that all that God has chosen in Christ redeemed, the Holy Spirit will call to life. In that same passage, Jesus said this. This is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all he hath given me, I should lose nothing, raise him up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that he that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. He said before that, he said, the Father which he giveth, he said, all that the Father giveth me, listen, shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. But Jesus in the next few verses in John 6 tells us this, that no man can come unto him. Wait a second, you just told me that they will, and now you're telling me they can't. How then can they? Except the Father which has sent me draw them. And this is the work of God the Holy Spirit. The Father sends the Spirit so as to draw the elect. To draw his people to himself. See there's a dead man in his sins. What can he do to come to Christ? He's dead. What can he do? But see now the Holy Ghost come upon him. See that he was not seeking or looking for God, yet God in free grace blows life into him, and he believes. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. As many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the sons of God, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. How were you born again? Was it of your will? No. I was willing as a byproduct of his grace. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. See, this again is not a matter of debate, but a matter of record of Scripture. Hebrew, uh, Psalm 110 and verse 3. Listen, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. See, I'm not unwilling. I'm willing, aren't you? You who believe, you're willing to believe, aren't you? Nobody dragged you. Nobody beat you. You were willing. How is it you were willing and others aren't? The Holy Spirit of God made the difference. You were born again of the Spirit. This is the message of the gospel. Is it the work of the Holy Spirit? You remember Lazarus, don't you? Do you suppose Lazarus could have ever resisted the, the call of Christ? No. And neither does a dead sinner ever resist the call of the Spirit of God to life. And matter of fact, when he's given life, why would he resist? Listen, if Christ calls you and you resist, it's because you're dead. If God ever gives you life, you won't resist. You'll believe. And the fifth thing is this, all who believe shall never perish. He said this, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life and you listen. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. For the Father which gave them me, remember we're talking about the elect, gave them me is greater than all. And no man shall pluck them out of his hand. Is there any hope for us to be lost? We who are saved, is there any hope? Is there any 
any way that this is going to turn out bad for you. I tell you what, life is full of bad, life is full of ills and troubles and difficulties, and we're not exempt from any of them. But you listen, nothing is going to happen to you except God give it permission. You're kept. You are kept in His hand. You see, to remove you from God is to take God from the throne. This is our surety. This is our hope. And so then I'll give you these other two quickly, very quickly. This is the gospel we preach. The sovereign election of God. The total depravity of man. The sovereign election of God. The... Uh, perfect work of Jesus Christ in redemption, the irresistible grace of the Spirit, and the preservation and keeping of the saints. This is the gospel. This is the gospel we preach. It is a gospel we must declare. We must declare it. Now to whom shall we preach this gospel? Very simply, everybody. Everybody. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, I know God's got elect. I know Christ died for them. I know the Spirit will call them. And only them. Nobody else. I know that with all my heart. Yet my commission is not to choose the elect. My commission is to preach to everyone. Because I have no idea who the elect are. Spurgeon was asked that question, Sir, if God has an elect people and He's only going to save them, why preach at all? Virgin said, Sir, if you would kindly point out the elect to me, I'll only preach to them. I don't know who they are. This is why he said, preach the gospel to every creature. Who do we preach to? Anyone who'd listen. I don't care how bad, how... It's not for us to question the, the evil nature of the man or anything. It is our mission to preach at every opportunity. Now, get up. Go out and preach it. Declare it at every opportunity. Every instance God opens the door. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Preach this gospel. We're not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. This is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. You see, I believe that God saves whomsoever will. I just don't believe He saves whomsoever won't. He won't. Now... This is the result. What is then the question? What is the result of this message? Some will believe and some won't. Simple. You preach to somebody, they believe. Praise God. You found one that was lost. You found God's elect. You preached to one who was called, uh, chosen and redeemed and called of God. No glory to you. Glory to God. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. We preach the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And everyone that believes. Now this matter in our text, this matter of baptism. He says he that believeth and is baptized. Baptism is not an addition or a necessary work to salvation. But rather it is the only means of confession. This idea of coming down to the altar and stuff, that is a totally Romanistic Catholic view. They, that comes from the coming to the altar or coming to get the Eucharist and stuff. That coming to the front is no confession of faith. The only confession of faith in Scripture that is recorded for us is baptism. If you're a believer in Christ, you should be baptized. You should be obedient. And you know what? I'm gladly obedient to this. I want to be identified with Him. And that's what baptism is. When we're plunged in the water, we are identifying with Christ. You're saying, I died with Him. I was buried with Him, and I rose together with Him. That's what you're identifying to all men. You're confessing. it. Now, the second group is this. Some will not believe. You won't believe your total depravity. You won't believe in God's sovereign election. You won't believe in Christ's perfect redemption. You won't believe in the irresistible call of the Spirit of God. You won't believe in the perseverance of the Spirit. Why? Because you're dead. You won't believe.
And you listen. If you won't believe, you will only receive what is justly your reward. Damnation. Damnation. Salvation is the gift of God's grace, but damnation is the just reward of sin. Therefore, if you're saved, you know this, all the glory belongs to God. And if you're damned, it's your own fault. Well, how do you reconcile that? I don't have to. You see, I'm here to preach the word of God. I'm not here to debate. Just to declare. And you know, Paul says this. And this is one thing that gives me confidence every time I preach the gospel. He said this. For we are a sweet savor of God. Let me get this thing right. I messed it up. <laughs> he says, We are a sweet savor of God. And we are triumphant every time we preach the gospel of Christ. We are a savor of life unto life to some, and a savor of death unto death to others. Today, listen, I'm a savor of life unto life to you who believe. That message I preach, you identify with everything there. You know that to be true. You know what you must do. You must go out and preach this gospel. You desire that others believe this gospel. But to some, I'm a uh, savor of death unto death. You despise it. You don't love it. You don't want it. And if you continue in that, you'll die in your sins and be damned. May God give us grace to go and preach His Word to every creature.